Hey guys, so by the 1700s, you have established all of your different British colonies. We have 13, that's why there are 13 stripes on the American flag. And um, these colonists are starting to have some things that join them together. So they all are founded for different reasons. They all have different distinct groups within them. Um, they're not exactly the same, but they come in a British kind of package. And one thing that creates this British type of package is not the fact that there are a lot of British settlers. No, 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 no. In fact, we're going to have immigrants coming from all over the place that will go into these uh, sometimes extremely diverse colonies. Uh, the reason that you have a British flavor to the British colonies is because of British trade. Remember before we talked about the navigation acts and you're forced to buy British goods if you're getting things that are manufactured. And um, what this does is it leads to kind of a unifying culture, right? It's, it's kind of, everyone has the same sorts of goods. You want to buy the tea kettle that's from Worcestershire in England and that makes you like your neighbor. I, I, don't, I don't care where you come from. If you immigrated to the United States, you probably know what a Big Mac is, right? So you could kind of think about this as a Big Mac effect. Everyone at some point in the United States eats a Big Mac. Everyone in the 1700s bought an English tea kettle. <laughs> it, and it, it, it kind of, it created a commonality in a weird way. We're starting to shape a culture. So who are these groups of people who are coming here at this time in the 1700s? So the largest group of newcomers are called the Scots-Irish. And who were they? So they weren't actually Irish. They were Scots-Irish, and this is a different thing. The Irish from Ireland will start coming over in droves in the mid-1800s. Uh, but they do have something to do with Ireland. So you know that Scotland and England are going to be kind of united after James I takes the throne. Uh, Elizabeth dies. James comes down from Scotland. He sits on the throne. Scotland and England then have a different relationship. Um, Oliver, in Elizabeth did a whole bunch of this, but Oliver Cromwell will further crush the Irish in Ireland. Uh, he'll commit what I think you could argue was a genocide there. Um, and what he will do, or and later kings and queens will do, is they will plant Scots people in Ireland who are Protestant with the idea that they will serve as models to these barbaric Catholic natives. And these barbaric Catholic natives will slowly lose rights to their land and the Scots-Irish will be large and in charge. This will actually set up a conflict that was later called the Troubles, which will be between England and Ireland, and it will last for very much of my lifetime. It was only recently settled under Tony Blair, who was a prime minister in Britain not that long ago, really. Um, during, Bill Clinton was president when Tony Blair was prime minister and in George W. Bush, Tony Blair was still in power um, and the troubles were ending. So anyway, the Scots were planted into Ireland to kind of rule this place and they became Scots-Irish. Uh, some of them have prominent positions, but it is no fun kind of ruling over this place. And uh, also the English kind of look down on them. It's They know that they don't have equal standing and they get tired of that. <laughs> They're like, this is hard work. So they go to the new world to have an easier, more respectable place where they can be viewed as more equal. Now, when they do come to the new world, many of them are gonna act as squatters and what does that mean? They're gonna see land that isn't being used, isn't in the middle of production. It doesn't matter if someone else claimed it or not. They're gonna say, oh, finders keepers. <laughs> they're gonna squat down and they're gonna claim it for themselves. You know, I wrote my name on that tree. That does not, by the way, make them hugely popular.
Another group of people come who are called the Pennsylvania Dutch. Now, this can be confusing because these Dutch people are not actually Dutch people. The Dutch are people from the Netherlands. The Pennsylvania Dutch were actually the Deutsch. It's just that people in America are not very good at distinguishing tiny little differences between various immigrant groups. And, you know, Dutch, Deutsch, well, what's the difference? Potato, potato, um, it's all the same. So <laughs> these guys, oh, hey, by the way, do we still sometimes kind of broad brush immigrants in ways that are perhaps not as nuanced as they should be? They kind of confuse people. I don't know. Maybe, maybe we should work on that a little bit. But anyway, these early German immigrants uh, want religious toleration predominantly. They're being pushed out of Europe because there are a lot of little wars that are going on over there and it's not very comfortable and they, they want to they worship as they see fit. And um, they also want land by the mid 1700s. And these guys are gonna actually earn some respect because they are excellent farmers. But having said that, both the Scots-Irish and the German immigrants are going to inspire some, uh, let me say, um, I don't know, angst amongst the people who are already here. And why is that? They set up little communities that are kind of set apart from the rest of everyone who is already here. And um, they have the, their own newspapers. They hang out with each other. The Germans have their own language. Um, that's, and they're, they're gonna just they're gonna be kind of set apart. So there will be pressure for them to assimilate. Buy your teapot, <laughs> get the English goods, be like us. Another group of people that are gonna come to the new world that uh, aren't always embraced are criminals <laughs> and the poor. They're gonna come. And, and why is that? This is in fact why Georgia is founded with James Oglethorpe. James Oglethorpe was a devout Christian. He felt that the poor who were stuck in jail because they couldn't pay their debts and other various sundry people needed to have a place where they could have a new start. So he proposes a colony. This is gonna be eventually the great state of Georgia. Uh, when he gets to Georgia, by the way, he outlaws some things, uh, hates slavery can't stand it, doesn't like it. No, thank you, sir. We are equal in the eyes of God, so we will not enslave others. Um, Georgia, unfortunately, eventually will become a slave society, but it did not start out that way. He also outlawed lawyers. Uh, no, sir, don't come here. You guys start arguments. <laughs> That's also, we'll go to the wayside. I, I think lawyers are important, but um, James Oglethorpe didn't like them. Why did England allow the poor to come to the new world? <laughs> Who wants the poor? Who wants criminals? Who Just push them out. Oh, by the way, the poor and criminals are not always the same thing, but in this context, they are because if you couldn't pay your debts, you had committed a crime, right? So I want you to understand that I'm not equating poverty with criminality, but England, did. Another reason to let Georgia get established is by the early 1700s, the colony of South Carolina was a very profitable place. They were selling things like indigo and rice and doing quite well. And the crown did not want any of the other empires that were in North America to threaten South Carolina. So what, who could threaten the, these people? they were people from the south people who had actually established the oldest continuously occupied uh settlement in what would later become the united states that is not jamestown in virginia it's actually saint augustine in florida the spanish still had holdings in north america and they will for a very very very, very long time and the idea was, if you throw these poor, if you throw these criminals, and some people were straight up criminals. Um, my husband is actually related to some horse thieves who were sent over, pushed out. Yay for me, I guess. Um, if, if you put those guys as a buffer in between the Carolinians and the Floridians, that's fine. Cool, cool, cool. No one even cares if those guys 
are uh, hurt. And by the way, this is another reason why James Oglethorpe bans Catholicism in Georgia in addition to slavery and lawyers. He says no Catholics can settle in this space. And that, of course, everyone hates Catholics in England by this point, uh, uh, straight up. Um, after James II was forced out during the Glorious Revolution, they even wrote a law that said you cannot be the monarch and be Catholic. So if, say, King William, well, Prince William, he's a prince right now. If Prince William got to the throne one day and he decided that he wanted to be a papist, he would have to uh, abdicate or they'd have to change the law one or the other. You can't be a Catholic king or queen in Britain. Regardless, the idea was if a Catholic settled in Georgia and the Spanish came into Georgia, that Catholic settler would have a conflict. Who would he support? The king in England or the pope in Rome? Let's just get rid of that conflict of interest. Let's not have any Catholics in Georgia. Now, when people come to the New World, they will find cities, but the cities in the English colonies are really small, especially if you compare them to the Spanish cities that are created in the Spanish Empire. Boston, Newport, New York, Philadelphia, Charlestown. Uh, these are places that you might stop at on your way to somewhere else. You would not come from the old world, go to the new world to settle in the city. That happens for some people, of course, but most people want land. This is a very agrarian society and people are gonna be rural. Yet cities are still gonna play an important part in shaping the culture as uh, they do today in the United States. Wealthy merchants will showcase goods that are coming from Europe, going back again to you gotta buy the teapot. Uh, this will show you what kind of clothing should be worn. Uh, what What is all the rage in Paris and London? Things like that. Um, you will have newspapers published in the cities. Newspapers like that published by Benjamin Franklin, for example, that will spread news wide and far. And that is very important. Ideas are going to be exchanged as part of the Enlightenment that will come from Europe to the United States. Uh, what was the Enlightenment? That is an intellectual revolution that started in the 1600s. Uh, you had a whole bunch of philosophers who were thinking, thinking, thinking. Guys like John Locke, for example, who really makes his mark during the Glorious Revolution. And as new political theories are going to be rocking Great Britain, the colonists are going to take note. In the new world, they're even going to idolize the government of the old world. Even though they're, they're living where they're living, they look back and think, oh, in the mother country, they're getting some things right. Uh, in some ways, because they idealize things that are going on in Britain so much, uh, they're going to get disillusioned. And that's kind of important to understand as we're marching closer to the American Revolution. Um, anyway, men in the colonies who are known for endless pursuit of knowledge, reason, and new ideas are American philosophs. Uh, again, the easiest to point to is Benjamin Franklin, a guy who was born in Boston in 1706 and was an early cosmopolitan man. Cosmopolitan is meant to be uh, worldly, urbane, cultured. Um, ben Franklin, a major founding father, uh, and a guy who will be important when the French and Indian War comes around because he's going to try and unite everyone with the Albany plan, which isn't gonna be embraced quite yet. Anyway, that kind of gives you an overview of uh, various things that are happening in the 1700s as we march towards the French and Indian War.